Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for tonight's session on taking Pogol activities online. We're going to be talking about some really, really great stuff. Um, Flynn Scientific and Pogol have been together for a number of years, and we're super excited about this presentation. You will be in capable hands tonight with three experienced Pogol practitioners. So we will get started in just a minute or so, just giving people time to file into the session. So we'll give it another um, 20 to 30 seconds and then we'll kick off the presentation proper. So thank you again for joining us. We really appreciate um, your taking the time. We know that it's valuable and um, thank you again. So it, it, it appears that our uh, <clears throat> We're stabilizing on attendance, so let's go ahead and get get this started. So I'm I'm very happy to join everybody. Uh, to, sorry to welcome everybody to tonight's session uh, about how the new life science, earth and space science, and physical science activities derive uh, and are aligned to the NGSS, and how they are being used currently in this new unique situation we find ourselves in. And as I said, as you were joining in, you're in capable hands. You are. So our, our three presenters tonight uh, are Amy Steele, who teaches, I'm going to go in no particular order here. Amy teaches middle school of elementary science in Lacey, Washington at Cornerstone Christian. She's been a teacher for 16 years and has been a Pogo practitioner for seven. She's also getting close to uh, finishing her master of science degree at Montana State in Bozeman. Lori Stanton is currently a middle school teacher of integrated science at Canyon Park Middle School in Bothell, Washington. I hope I said that right. Prior to that, she taught high school biology and physical science at Bellevue Christian High School. She is also an OSPI, Washington State Science Fellow, and in for a number of years, and she recently completed her Master of Science in Science Teaching from Montana State. So again, very capable hands. And finally, we have Mary Sullivan, who having taught for a number of years, now works with the Seattle Pacific University School of Education. She was our 2013 Washington State Secondary Science Teacher of the Year and has been the facilitator of many, many Pogo workshops nationally and internationally, and is the lead author for three new Pogo activity collections that support NGSS middle school standards. So uh, my name is Mike from Flynn. Without further ado, I will turn it over to the Pogo people. Uh, good evening. My name is Mary Sullivan. Thank you for joining us. And Mike, thank you for the kind introductions. Amy, Lori, and I are grateful to be collaborating with Flynn Scientific and the Pogo Project. We hope that this webinar will be useful to you and your peers as we share our new Pogo activities and some ideas for using them in an online middle school learning environment. Let's take a quick look at what we will address during the next 45 minutes. First, I will spend a few minutes summarizing Pogo pedagogy for those of you who don't know a lot about it. Uh, secondly, I will explain how we built the new Pogo activity collections from the foundation of the next generation science standards. Third, Amy and Lori will share their personal experience of how they have moved Pogo to an online teaching environment for their middle schoolers. Fourth, Mike will share a bit about the Pogo middle school and high school activities that are available through Flynn. And last, we will have a short question and answer session based on questions that you will submit through the chat function on Zoom. Let's start with a short polling question to determine our participants' level of experience with Pogo strategies. This will be very helpful for Amy and Lori and me to be able to adjust our presentation as needed. Max, thank you for helping us with this. Max, you want to give uh, five more seconds and then we can see what's what's what here. Sounds good. Almost done. All right. 
let's end polling. Well, this is good for us to know. <laughs> this is great. Um, I think that the introduction that we have coming up next will be very useful and allow you to ask good questions that we can then help answer at the end. Thanks, Max. I think we are done with that and I will move on. Are you able to close out the um, polling results for us, Max? Sorry, can you still see them? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, you very much. That's perfect. Perfect. No POGO is an acronym that means Process Oriented Guided Inquiry Learning. It is a method of teaching created from the best practices of cooperative learning and the best research about the way our brains naturally learn through inquiry organized in a learning cycle format. The PO in POGO refers to cooperative learning strategies, including the seven POGO process skills listed here. These skills are important in both classroom and workplace settings. Take a few moments to read through this list and then we'll move on. Also, one thing, Mary, if I, if I could jump in, if people want to um, pose questions in the Q&A function, um, other people will be able to upvote them so we can get a sense for what some of the more popular questions are. I know some people are putting questions in the chat. So yes, I think I misspoke and said chat function, but it is a Q&A function. Thank you. Oh, that's okay. All right, let's move on. The GI or guided inquiry portion of POGOL refers to the guided inquiry format of POGOL activities. Here is a diagram of the learning cycle used to organize questions in these activities. Student teams begin with explore questions that lead them to identify the most important information in a model. The model might be a series of drawings, it might be a chart, it might be a graph, it might be a variety of different formats. Then those students answer the invent questions that guide them to analyze and synthesize the information in the model as they develop a new concept. Finally, students apply the new concept to a novel situation. Altogether, the Pogel approach helps students to construct their own knowledge, work in self-managed teams, and teach, discuss, and learn from other students as teams complete activities based on the learning cycle. Teachers act as facilitators of student learning while they attend to cooperative learning principles and help students improve their process skills. Reflection by both teacher and student helps improve learning, team function, and overall teaching practice. POGOL is a pedagogy in which education research directly informs teaching practice. When choosing any curricular resources, it's important for us to know how they were developed. Our new POGOL life science, earth and space science, and physical science activity began when a team of teachers who had used POGOL decided to create some new POGOL activities specifically designed for use in their middle school classrooms. The team started by reviewing every single NGSS middle school performance expectation. Um, in my portion tonight, I will focus on the physical science activities. Amy and Lori will each introduce a life science activity and an earth science activity. After lots of discussion and digging into the NGSS and its supporting documents, our team identified 27 different performance expectations that work very well with guided inquiry learning activities. From these performance expectations, we created 
39 separate activities to help students master those expectations. We specifically omitted any performance expectation that would best be mastered through lab or research experiences rather than a guided inquiry activity. For each collection, in this case, I'm showing you the physical science collection, we organized a logical sequence of learning activities where new concepts are built on concepts mastered during the prior activities. Each collection includes a short Pogel activity that introduces students to team roles. The roles help students to function more effectively as a learning team. We intentionally incorporated the science and engineering practices and the cross-cutting concepts that fit each activity. We didn't align our activities with the NGSS. Rather, we started from the NGSS and we designed from the performance expectations. Let's take a closer look at one of the three physical science activities that focus on energy concepts. For each activity, the writing team identified two or three specific learning targets. Each target was directly related to a specific section of one performance expectation. We solicited feedback from college professors who acted as our content area experts. Then the Pogel, some Pogel experienced teachers from a variety of schools across the United States worked with their students to classroom test every activity multiple times. We rewrote and revised each activity over and over and over again. Then the team created resources to help teachers succeed in using Pogel activities with their students. These resources include a list of learning outcomes, an estimate of how much time the activity requires on average, the NGSS performance expectation that is the basis for the activity, the prerequisite knowledge required for students to successfully complete the activity without teacher direct teaching or intervention, tips for how to prepare before using the activity with students, teacher references, and additional ideas and links to use with students if the teacher decides to extend the lesson beyond the guided inquiry activity. In addition, the team created short questions for teachers to use in formative or in summative assessments with one question specifically related to each learning target. Finally, the team wrote an answer key for the activity an answer key for the extension questions that are used to differentiate the activity for highly capable students and teams, and an answer key for the assessment questions. Now let's find out how two experienced POGO practitioners are using the new POGO activities as they teach their middle school students in an online learning environment. Amy, take it away. Thank you, Mary. Um it's been so fun to watch this tool come from where we started with wanting to adapt high school activities down to deciding that it was better to just start from where we were and make something better and fully designed for middle school use. And we found that they don't just stay in middle school, that they often find their way to high school and other areas as well. So that's kind of been a delight to watch. But um, today I'd like to share a little bit about how I'm using them synchronously through breakout rooms, specifically with my students here in Olympia area. Um, our school's located in Lacey, but it's the Olympia area, and we're a private school. So we fairly quickly started just trying to adapt to moving to online learning models um, within just a few days of everybody being sent home from school in Washington. My students, um, I had several poll activities planned throughout the school year for the rest of the school year that I really did not want them to miss. And um, so 
so we just tried to figure out a way very quickly to adapt this to synchronous learning through breakout rooms via Zoom meetings with students. Um, I want to say, first of all, my students are fairly used to using Pogol. They began using those pretty quickly with me. I have them through sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. So that's kind of my scenario is that I often have students for three years, um, maybe more. But they are used to using them, so it's not a big leap to go right to using them in breakout rooms online at Zoom time. However, if I were using them without having taught them before, I would definitely start with that beginning activity just to see how to do the roles and, and what's expected for kids. Um, this is one that I used just week before last with my sixth graders. Um, we're starting a unit on ecology, and this is one of the first things we did was we talked about how do living things interact. And here's the model. It's a very simple model. It's super straightforward for kids and highly engaging. And it starts out with just um, the learning outcomes are there. We talk about what we're gonna be learning about and it's going to be looking for those main types of relationships among organisms and being able to identify and even discriminate between different types of relationships among organisms. Okay, I think we're ready to go to the next one, Mary. One of the things I did pretty quickly, um, there was try to manually pre-organize my breakout rooms. Um, it has an automatic setting for breakout rooms versus a manual setting. Um, and if I knew pretty well who was going to show up, I would try to have that set ahead of time. However, there is a way to choose an automatic setting if you like your odds and you know your conflicts pretty well. You can actually take a few minutes to move kids around while you're talking and just very quickly click um, swap on that and, in, and just very quickly move them to a room if you see something's not going to work out very well. This is model two from that same um, interaction of different organisms. Google activity and as you can see it's a little bit more complex but um, we went from what's to dinner to that's mine. So if you can guess, this one's about competition. Sorry, it's been a long day. And um, I just found that kids were super excited to go back to something they knew. They loved the breakout rooms because they could talk interactively with each other. And that seemed to be a really good thing for them. Mary, if you wanna to go to the next one. I'm having a little trouble sharing mine from this end. Um, one of the things that was toughest for me was trying to figure out how to assign roles and just my sixth graders, I very quickly jumped into their rooms and joined and they, um, at that point, I looked at who was in the room and very quickly kind of had preset, if I had preset the rooms and I had preset the roles as well. And that was pretty straightforward. Um, However, if I had automatically let them sort, that was a little bit trickier um, to get in there and just decide really quickly who's gonna feel comfortable doing which role. Um, and I found that the reader was really important, but so was the time manager on that. So those were two things there. Um, there are some ways to use qualifiers with that. Um, whose birthday is closest, who's the oldest, who's the youngest, who's, um, who's got you know, tennis shoes on at home today, who's, who's been in their PJs all day. So there's some qualifiers that can make it fun and we have used those. Um, in the chat, I would use the chat function to go in and just give them chat reminders on timing. Before I assign a, a model, I say we need to be at question you know, five within, within four or five minutes and they do move pretty quickly through them. You can let kids self-assign roles. That can get pretty risky. Um, if you have people in there who, who maybe aren't quite uh, leveled up on where they need to be on listening to others. Um, but my favorite thing about using Pogol online with the breakout rooms has actually been teacher as roamer. You get to pop in there with just three or four kids and they're so delighted to see you and you're so delighted to see them and you, you get to hear their thought processes just like you would in the classroom. And then they also have the ability to raise their hand on, um, on the interactive menu with Zoom and let you know if they need help or they can use the chat box to do that as well. 
Okay, last one. I love this. The, this is a great story. Three stories give a little, get a little, and um, kids are able to do that. Mary, did, can you go back one? I think we hopped. Sorry, I skipped too far. Oh, did we? Okay, no, we're good. I think we're ready to go on. Okay, when we're done, kids have, um, I'm working with about three different ways to assess this or just even check in with me. Kids are photo submitting it to my email. They're taking a picture of their completed activity. Um, they are scanning it on their printer to me and sending it as an attachment, or they are actually physically doing a drop off. We have a drop box at school one day a week, and most of them are using the drop box at school and then picking up the next week's uh, work at that time. Um, assessments are emailed as an attachment or they're picked up and then returned in the same fashion. And so that's how we've been managing it. And here's an example of one of our assessments. It's just really simple and straightforward. Um, three different, three different um, learning expectations and objectives and, and performance expectations and, and three different questions. And that's about all I've got. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, and now we're going to look at how Lori uses her Pogel activities in her classrooms, which are quite different from Amy. Alrighty, you know, let me share my screen. Absolutely. Okay. Um, there we go. Alrighty, hi, I'm Lori, and I want to share with you a little bit about where I am um, and what I'm doing with online teaching. I teach synchronously with my students 40 minutes, just one time a week in a class hey, Zoom. Hey, Lori, can I jump in? Yeah. I'm not seeing yeah. your screen. Are you seeing uh, Lori's screen, Mary? Uh, um, no. Do you okay. want me to just start going? Lori, do you want me to go through your slides? No. Did you, um, did you Hang on. on. Hang on. There you go. How's okay, that? Is that better? <laughs> Sorry, folks. Our, we're not perfect at Zoom yet. Sorry. I teach synchronously. I meet with my kids one time a week for 40 minutes, and then I have office hours outside of that. Uh, the focus in my district is very much on spending time checking in with our kids, listening to them, giving them time to talk um, and share, and then to send kids off with projects and choices um, of things to do and ways to demonstrate their learning. Most of my kids are online. My district has worked really hard to make sure that students have gotten laptops and hotspots. Um, Monday, I met with two, two of my classes and I only had two, of, two kids absent, which I thought was really awesome. Um, I wanna share with you a Pogel activity that I'm hoping to use in a week or so and the planning that I've done to kind of get ready for that. Uh, I have remodeled this activity so that students can access it online and in Google Classroom. Um, so here's what I did. I printed out the student activity and I added color detail to it. I almost always preview quite a bit of an activity with students before we start in class and have them highlight or circle or star things that I want to make sure stand out. And then I scanned that document and cut and pasted it in pieces into this Google Doc. You can see I added a few extra directions um, and some other details to try to make things really obvious to students. Um, I won't have students answer every single question. I just am not gonna have enough time to do that. Um, but I will post this document on Google Classroom so all kids have a copy of it. So I'm gonna walk you through the first couple models of this activity and share how I might run this in my class. Um, just an aside, like Amy, my kids have done POGO activities and they have um, used roles. So this might be more than you, I wouldn't do all of this the first time, certainly. I would probably split it down to a smaller chunk. Um, so starting the activity, I would have my screen shares. Um, students would just be looking at my screen and looking at my copy of the document. Um, you're looking at a cropped view of what I would see. The student view is similar, but of course they would not see polling. Um, but they do have that participant tab so they can communicate with me and give me feedback about faster or slower, or yes or no. 
Um, I always begin an activity by reading that why introduction box at the top that allows the last few kids to kind of catch up and get on board with us. This time I will probably read this whole first page and complete it out loud to the class myself. I'd start by pointing out key details of the model that I want to make sure they notice like point one and the key and the arrows and then verbally answer questions one, two, and three, thinking out loud. These are all really straightforward questions, just exploring the concrete details of the model. Um, I could then ask the students uh, to give me a thumbs up if they agree, did I do something wrong? And I might wait for a minute to make sure that everybody's participating um, before I moved on. Here's the next chunk of model one. In a, in a document, of course, this flows right along and isn't split up. You can see I created a poll here to go through some of the questions. So I would read question four out loud and then pause to let them answer it and then read question five and pause to let them answer it. And then at question six, I would point out that that red star means to me that we're gonna do that in our small group in a little while in our breakout room and we're skipping it at this moment. And then I would scroll the poll down to number seven and read that and let them answer that question. You can um, close the poll and choose to share the results with them. If it looks like everybody got 100%, we could just move right on. Um, but that would be a checkpoint um, for us at that point. Here's the next chunk of the model. I'll let them know we're going to be moving to small groups in a little bit. Um, and that they need to remember that when they get to their small groups, they need to be sure they have their roles taken care of and that they all have this document open um, on their screen. I'll point out the details that eight and nine, they'll just be talking about and answering these verbally. And that number 10, this is a red star question, they will be um, typing something in there while they work with their small group. I'd also do a quick preview of model two. I would be hoping we could get through model one and two. You might choose to end at the end of model one for a class period. Um, same thing if the question is unmarked, my expectation is, is that they will talk about that orally and agree to the answer and then type the answers to the red star questions. Um, for this model, I was planning on asking my students to actually physically trace the arrows at point two and look at what's the direction of the arrows as you reach the surface. Um, so that, and then answer that poll question so that before I send them out into small groups, I know that we're on the same track and that we've noticed there's a difference between point one and point two, the convergent and divergent. Um, sections there. Here's the um, questions for model two. Notice there's again some red star questions um, that they need to actually be typing on. I will give the students their final reminders for breakout rooms, where to find the document, that they need to minimize their zoom screen so they can see their document, and that their goal is to go back to model one when they open their document, look at model one, scroll down and work from number six through number 17, typing answers to the star questions and just talking about the other ones. Um, my hope is that they'll have about 15 minutes that I can allot to them to do that. Um, and then here's a shot of my breakout room set up. I would hop from group to group briefly to see how it's going and chat. I would start with the group that I think is going to have the most trouble getting started or the most trouble following directions. Um, I've tried to assign breakout. I do pre-assign breakout rooms friends so they have a chance to interact and socialize. And, and I've purposefully grouped my special needs students. In most of my classes, I have an educator and they are in a small group. They may be working with the students and doing the whole activity orally. Uh, the paraeducator may be scribing and turning in a group document for that group. Um, we have talked about having some students just showing the models to their parents and the activity to their parents and talking about it with their parents and getting an email from their parents. 
Um, so that's still a work in progress, but I totally trust them to make some of those decisions about here's a great idea um, for what to do with those kids. At the end of class, here we are back in a whole class Zoom. I want to just really quickly review. We did divergent and convergent um, areas of the plates. And then my homework assignment would then be for them to finish model one and two if we got both of those done through number 17. Um, and the next time we meet, we would review that briefly, maybe using an assessment question and then work through model three. So I might want students to look at model three and just be looking what's different about this next one. You could preview that before they show up. Um, I would also probably assign, assign some additional resources, things for kids to explore during the week, um, a FET, depending on your technology, some vid short videos or iris animations, a reading. Um, I can't require anything with materials at home because kids have different resources, but I could suggest an optional model building activity. Um, for example, the sandwich squishing plate tectonics um, if students are interested and have what they need. Um, so that's all I have for you. I hope this was helpful and gave you some ideas about what you might do in, with your kids. And now I will pass you back to Mike and I will stop sharing when I find my mouse. There you go. Yeah, thank you, Lori. I, will, I just want to take um, a minute or two to show you where you can access these materials um, if you choose to. And I'm going to share my screen now. If you want to learn more about Pogel, just navigate to our flynnside.com website. And we have some real estate for Pogel right down here. I'm circling with my virtual little clicker. And if you click that, you can navigate to a landing page devoted entirely to Pogel. It will talk about uh, some of the philosophy behind Pogel. It'll give you some videos um, that talk about Pogel in uh, some detail. And then down here, you can um, click the different collections to get more specific information about them. You can see tables of contents. Um, the, these new collections that, that Lori and Mary and Amy have, have discussed are smaller collections that we've typically done. Um, and so they're, they're very um, kind of affordable in the low $20 range. And if you purchase these, you will be uh, given access to essentially a digital copy that you can um, kind of share out with your students on a activity by activity basis. The other thing, if, if you would like to learn more about um, kind of how to deploy Pogel synchronous versus asynchronous, I just wanna show you, we did a webinar last week um, with some other Pogel practitioners. And if you would like to, to view that recording um, because they, they provided a good take on you know, some more asynchronous environments, you can come to our, let me back up, I did that a little quick. You can come back to Flynn Scientific, and then you go to Flynn at Home Science, and then under our at home la live lab series, you'll have the option to click here to watch, um, sorry, to click here to watch previous recordings. And way down at the bottom here, you'll see you can click here to record Oh, this is to watch the, the middle school. I'll have to, Max, do you know where the, um, I'm sorry, the Mike, Mike. <clears throat> hey Mike, right? sorry. That, that is the high school one. Oh, this is the high school one. We just have yeah. it. Okay, so what we'll do is we will post the recording to the middle school one and also the high school one presently. If you wanna see the high school one, you can click here and we'll get this current webinar up shortly and the differences will be apparent to you. I apologize for that. So that's, that's all I had. That's all I wanted to show you. I'm going to hop back out and uh, jump into some questions, if that's okay with, with you, Mary and Lori and Amy. Uh, I have one more screen bit to share, if that's possible. Oh, sure, yeah. I will stop sharing. Sorry, I forgot. Thanks, Thanks very much. Okay, so that's the screen. Oh, my. <laughs> All right, so we just wanted to show people a little bit of what the activities are that we're doing. You'll notice that the life science and earth and space science are available. Physical science will be available soon. Um, and here are some other resources that Mike discussed. 
and to note that there's also a conceptual physics activity book coming up and some others. Uh, uh, the Pogo project would like to invite you, especially those of you who do not have any experience with Pogo, to consider some opportunities for professional development. Uh, we have three day summer workshops across the country with a variety of tracks that you can choose from. Those may or may not be held this summer, depending on what all happens, as we know. You can also schedule an on-site workshop through the POGA project to be done for your school or your district. And there are also e-series and webinar offerings on the POGA website, pogo.org. Back to you, Mike. Okay, great. Yeah, I can, um, I don't need to show my screen. I'm just going to kind of start shuffling through these questions here. Uh, a lot of great questions. Somebody asked, how do we get access to these activities? And to do that, you can navigate to that Pogo landing page. Um, how much will this program cost was another question. I, I'm just going to answer a couple administrative questions here, Mary, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to the pros. Um, so the, the, these books cost about, um, 20, I can't remember the exact price, but 22 to $25. Um, so now with that out of the way, I'm gonna get to the questions. Um, so one question we have, um, so how does it work if more than half of your students are not showing up for online sessions? I know in these unique times that can be hard. Anything people wanna add about that? Um, I think the first few weeks we were out, that was a little bit of a tricky part for me too, um, as we were sussing out who had technology and who did not have access to laptops and got, and eventually we were able to get um, Chromebooks checked out to families in our school. Um, so there was some technology issues for certain. And then there were also just some um, kids maybe or families who were just very stressed and very stretched. And there was not a lot of kids who just weren't showing up because they didn't want to. That, that being a home alone kind of got real old real fast for a lot of our students. Um, so there was a little bit of a lag there. I reached out to a lot of my kids just to let them know that, you know, what we would be doing online and what we would be doing in Zoom class. And um, that did tend to bring my attendance up. And today I had most students in class in Zoom and um, it just varies from day to day, but um, I don't know what your accountability would be with your district or your specific school, but um, with our school, it's, it's pretty still high on the account accountability from uh, parents and students as far as the expectations go. So I would say I would work with who's there and um, just do your best to maybe reach out for a couple more. So. Yeah, I'll just add in that I don't know about you guys, but I record my, have to record my Zoom classes. So I post those on Google Classroom when I'm done. So I can, they can access that and watch and see what we have, what we did. I post my slide deck so they can look through the slide deck and see what we've done. And if there's any links I've put in there, um, they can access those. I've, I've, we t are taking attendance and the, so the attendance secretary is following up with kids that aren't showing up for class and frequently then I'll get an email from them and it may be oh we have one Chromebook and five kids and I just couldn't come to class today um, but I generally have been able to follow up and have a zoom office hour with that student and at least talk through the beginnings of some of an activity with them um, so then it's just kind of one-on-one -on -one chatting with them via email or a Zoom office hour um, yeah. to catch up. But kids have shown up more since I have put them in small groups with their friends. I think middle schoolers are hungry to see their friends. And <laughs> if they know they have time to talk, they'll be there if they can. Yeah. I also have posted my Zoom recordings. I didn't think about that. That, that has helped some kids access it if there's like a some competition for the computer resource. Awesome, thank you for that. Um, another question we, we got asked, and there's a number of great questions, and I, I think we covered on this somewhat, but I just wanna ask it directly. Do the students have the document in front of them while you're going over it, or can you post it somehow at same time of chat, at the time of chat? Just a little bit about, do they have it in front of them? Do you post it or a combination of both? Amy, you wanna go first? Um, my students 
I would say most of them have the document in front of them, have a paper copy. I have also scanned and emailed that copy specifically to that child. Um, just a few times, but mostly they've picked it up from school during the weekly drop off pickup. Yeah, my students may or may not have a printer. I cannot require my students to print something out. So my things are all posted on Google Classroom. Um, we've been working these last few weeks to get in the practice of, yes, you can minimize your Zoom screen and you can see a document at the same time. <laughs> so practicing opening up Google Classroom and seeing your Zoom screen and trying to get those things happening together. Um, we're working on that, but some of them, some kids are printing things out and sending me pictures, but a lot of kids are just online. Awesome. Yeah. And then there's a number of questions of the number of people commenting um, about how much they love Pogol and wondering if they will have access to some of these activities. Um, so to that end, we will, um, when we go back uh, to our office, quote unquote, um, and we're in there off and on, we'll do our best to get some on the website. But if um, and until then, uh, kind of stay tuned, check back to the, the Flynn landing page, and we'll do our best to get some of these new middle school activities, a couple of these posted so that you can download them and use them with your students. Um, another question we had was uh, kind of a pedagogical question. What are the key differences between Pogel and the 5E model of instruction? Okay, I'll step in and help with that one. <clears throat> uh, Pogel, the Pogel learning cycle and the 5E learning cycle are both built from the same educational research. So they're very, very similar uh, with a little bit of different naming here and there. The Pogol activities, since they are paper and pencil or laptop and stylus activities, they often do not include um, um, an engagement activity. We've put at the top of each a Y box as our engagement, but as a teacher, I always did something else right before that would help lead students into it, but they're very similar. Great, thank you for that. I, I want to address a few questions um, just about accessibility and usability of these, um, and some of these questions came up on the, the webinar that um, your colleagues conducted last week. Um, and I can speak to some of the things that, that um, Laura Trout and Steph talked about then. So, some people are asking, um, is it possible to order Pogel activities in a digital and editable version? And can these documents be electronic versions and shared uh, through Google Classroom? So I can tell you those kinds of questions, if um, what, what some of the, uh, the authors talked about last week was you can take the PDFs, you have the file, and they would copy some of that content into Google Docs and make the content available to their students via Google Docs and open up the comment field in Google Docs so that the students could comment back and forth. So they were essentially copying and pasting the content from PDFs into Google Docs. Um, we, we, don't, we don't kind of distribute the Pogol activities at, in editable form because um, we find that we'll find copies on the internet that have been um, changed and modified and don't really adhere to the kind of pedagogical perspective. So for that reason, we don't give them in Word docs or any kind of other format. But again, a lot of people do use the, the Google Classroom and Google Docs based on based on last week's webinar. And do, do you have anything you want to add to that, Mary and Lori and Amy? This is just what I kind of have learned via interacting with um, other public practitioners. This is Mary. I will add that it takes us 20 to 25 hours to put together one of these activities, have it tested, get it vetted. And when we found that when teachers go in and say, well, I want to shorten it, so I'll pull out these questions, we've tested it very carefully so that the steps from one question to the next actually allow students to develop their own concepts effectively. Uh, without teacher intervention. And that starts falling apart pretty quickly if teachers start moving questions around or pulling some out or adding some. In. So we can't guarantee what will happen to the activities if they start getting edited. Great, yeah, thank you for that. Um, other questions that are coming in. Um, 
This is, this is kind of a tough one. This is, and I, I asked this question because I think uh, some other people are facing this. Half my county doesn't have internet and our district isn't requiring them to do the work we send. So half the kids just aren't doing it. I've used Polo before in high school, but wonder if there's anything you would recommend for this circumstance. I know that's a tough one. I, anybody, that's a tough one. I mean, uh, anybody have any thoughts on that? I think we all, we all are having a lot of kids that are just off the grid in a lot of ways. Um, I think we have kids dealing with some extraordinary circumstances, no matter what our school looks like. And it's just really, I think we're trying to serve the kids we can as best we can. That's been my, my go-to thought is do as much as I can for who's there and try to check in with the ones who aren't. Um, I have done a drive-by drop-off and there's some other things that I've just tried to reach out as much as possible for my students. And I know that's not possible for everyone, um, but I would just, yeah, that's, it's just a really tough set of circumstances for many kids right now. Um, this is Mary. I would add in there that in this time for our middle school students, I think the most important function we have as teachers is to help them with the social and emotional learning piece, to help them self-calm, self-soothe, to realize that anything they miss right now, they'll be able to figure this out. This isn't the end of the world, although it may feel like that to them. So our calmness, our humor, and our voices of encouragement, that's what they'll remember. They won't remember the polar activities. Yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm seeing some other questions, um, some interesting um, questions and comments in the Q&A. Somebody said, can you open the PDF in Cami? And that was something that one of our presenters last week used was Cami to um, kind of deploy this in a synchronous way. So I think a lot of the these things do work and people use them, um, different methods there. Um, what else? What else? Um, let's see. We have a comment. We have paper packets and those that opted for their Chromebooks. This seems great for the regular school year for mine. I have a question. People are asking about, um, are, there, are there online versions of the high school activities available? And uh, currently the high school activities are um, books. We're transitioning over to a more digital model right now. But um, if anybody has any, any um, questions about accessing those high school materials, I, I want to give out my email. I did this on last week's webinar. It was pretty successful in getting people access when they needed it. My email is mmarvel, M-M-A-R-V-E-L, at flynnside.com. So if, if you have um, trouble getting access to some of these materials, please do send me an email and I can help facilitate that. Um, let me take another scroll through the questions here. Your online versions. <clears throat> Somebody asks, is there a whole year, or is there a whole year of Pogo activities for physical science? Mary, did you kind of consider that to be a whole year of activities? Okay, I'll speak to that. What we have found is for students in grades six, seven, and eight doing the activities, there are 17 activities, each with on average, well, three models. And we have found that students tend to, Lori and um, Amy can uh, check in here too, but often in a middle school environment, one class period is one model and the questions associated it. So I'll, with it, although there are 17 activities, that's 17 times three class days. So that's not a full school year, but it's a really nice uh, grid that you can, of course, you'll want some labs and other experiences in there, not just this, but um, I have a teacher who's using, I have a number of teachers who are using this as their only curriculum and then interspersing labs and videos and simulations. So, yeah. Thank you for that. And I, I just got a request. Can you type, I, I just, for everybody out there, I said my email, but I just typed it into the chat. So you can take that down. And if you have trouble accessing, please do send me an email. Um, a lot of great questions. Um, Somebody mentioned argument-driven inquiry. I think, um, is this similar to argument-driven inquiry? I think ADI, is that the acronym, argument-driven inquiry? Mm -hmm. I, can, I can speak a little bit to that. Um, I use both um, in my classroom. 
And I find them to have very different feels and very different gifts for kids as far as what it brings to it. They're very different critters. And I think a lot of the philosophy behind both and a lot of the, the research underneath that underlies both of them um, is somewhat similar. Uh, Pogel came, I think a little, I don't know what the, the timing is on that, but, but I think, I don't know how long Pogel has been around, but um, I do both. And I find that they're just really different um, as far as you're going narrowing down towards something in Pogel and you're kind of widening it out more in ADI and then bringing it back in. Um, I find Pogel's a little bit easier to do time-wise in three or four days. And I, when I do ADI, I'm looking at two weeks of instruction time by the time we're finished. So, and ADI is, is great. I really enjoy using it a few times per year, but I use Pogel probably mm -hmm, three to four times as much as I do ADI. So I don't know if that helps at all, <laughs> but I hope it would answer someone's question. Great, thank you for that. Um, is there anything we, we were able to cover uh, the majority of the questions, is there anything else um, that you would like to add at this point, uh, Lori, Mary, and Amy? I'll, I'll thank you for giving this great webinar. Anything else you wanna add before we sign off? Uh, this is Mary. Thank you for letting us be here with you. And I just thank every one of the teachers who's listening in because you are a gift to your students and their parents and your administrators. So thank you for the work you do. Yes, thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. Well, and, and oh, sorry, I interrupted. Oh, I say just keep it up. It's been a lot of work and keep going. Yeah, and thank you all from Flynn. I'll thank everybody for attending. I'll, I'll thank Lori and Amy and Mary again for being so gracious with their time to spend it with us this evening. And thank you all for being gracious with, you, with your time for attending. Um, so uh, if you attended this webinar, you will get an email with the recording. And again, check back to that uh, Pogo site. We'll try to get a few um, free activities up there. So check that Flynn at Home site and uh, we'll do that for you. If you have any issues, uh, send me an email. I'll try to help you work through them. Thanks, everybody.